Hi everybody, it's me again, Brian Von VA, your favorite narrator from this part of Ohio. I've got a question for you. What are the strangest D&D rule interactions that you've had? Leave yours down in the comments below. I'd say the interaction of hit points and failing is pretty strange. Let me get to it. Hit points represent a combination of bodily health, combat savvy, and the heroic karma that allows high-level D&D characters to enjoy cinematic battles against gargantuan dragons and to wade through hordes of bad guys with the dramatic finesse of Jackie Chan. You'd think that falling would be a situation where no amount of heroic karma would save you, yet it deals hit point damage, all at the measly rate of 1d6 per 10 feet, no less, with a max of 20d6. The strange result is that an unlucky level 1 wizard can fall 10 feet and straight up die, but a mighty barbarian can fall from low earth orbit, land with the literal force of a meteor strike, then dust himself off and go about his day. David Collins said the exact thing that I've always found strange, but I'd like to add another. Anyone can be a spellcaster if you go by the rules. According to the DMG or Dungeon Master's Guide, attunement rules errata. As long as you can cast a spell, you are considered, guess what, a spellcaster, which means every single high elf, drow, tiefling, or any race that casts innate spells are now considered spellcasters as well as open hand monks, can they can cast sanctuary, shadow monks, they got darkness, sun soul monks, burning hands much, totem barbarians, yep, they can cast speak with animals, and many, many more. As a special edition, barbarians and monks of those paths, maybe there are other examples that don't come to mind, are technically spellcasters, but they have no spellcasting ability, so no spell save or spell attack bonus. At least racial casters have an associated ability, but monks only have a key save. Technically, they can't be used for spells, and barbarians don't even have that. The Lucky Feet and Disadvantage The Lucky Feet allows you to spend luck points to roll an additional d20 and choose which one you use, while making an ability check, attack roll, or a saving throw. Disadvantage has you roll two d20s and take the lowest. When you spend a luck point on a roll with disadvantage, you roll two d20s and pick one of the three, either specific versus general and the disadvantage simply fizzles, or it comes after, but you can pick any one of your three dice. So, the lucky guy with the big sword can choose to fall over and swing without looking. He's more accurate doing that than not. Now, sorry if I did anything wrong, by the way. I don't have the player's handbook right now. The Goblin Railroad System of Combat Transportation in 3.5 edition. Here's the premise. A fighter with the supreme cleave feat upon killing an opponent can take up to a five foot step and strike at another foe. If that foe dies, then the fighter can repeat the process. The idea was that you could line up a bunch of goblins five feet apart in a line, and a fighter with a two-handed weapon and this feat, which requires a plus 14 base attack bonus and a 20 strength, would kill every goblin in the line. With his base attack, he can't miss except on a critical failure. He has multiple attacks and does enough damage that even the bare minimum damage roll will kill the goblin. All attacks happen in one round, six seconds. So, if you line up 80 goblins, the fighter can cover 400 feet in six seconds, making a fully armored knight faster than an Olympic sprinter, all while killing 80 goblins along the way. Now we had falling rules, but now we're gonna be talking about the rules of jumping in fifth edition. Now, according to these rules, you can jump your strength score after a 10 foot head start but each foot of jumping counts as a foot of movement. A character with 20 strength, buffed by the jump spell triples the jump distance, and the boots of striding and springing also triples it, can jump mm, 180 feet. However, with how the rules are set up, this is effectively done over six rounds, assuming a speed of 30 feet, which is the minimum with the boots, meaning you are in the air for 36 seconds. 
Now, some basic calculation on this tells you that you're going to be in the air for that long, you will jump to a height of around 1,600 feet. Yeah, that's pretty darn high. For individual rules that were abused in creative ways, the best, for my money, is the Peasant Railgun. Oh no. The Peasant Railgun makes a return. Here's a breakdown. This works based on the way a held action is governed in older editions. I haven't played 4th edition or later, so I'm not sure if it still works. These reaction moves are treated as taking place instantly. That is, within the same combat round as the trigger condition. Now, held actions are usually used to set up a bit of teamwork when a party needs to do something that involves more than one character. But, with the way the rule is stated, some players got creative. So let's take a few thousand peasants or other low-level NPCs, line them up shoulder to shoulder so that each one is within easy arm's reach of the other two on either side of him. Order all of them to hold an action. As soon as the guy on one side hands you an object, turn and hand it off to the next guy in line, or drop it if no one's there. Two other players start a, preferably non-lethal, fight to prompt moving the game to combat turns. Now when your turn comes up, you hand the first guy in line a small object, like a smallish rock or something. The first peasant's held action triggers, and he hands off the rock to the next peasant, whose held action triggers, and he hands off the rock to the next peasant, whose held action triggers, and so on and so forth. Under the rules governing held actions, this chain of handoffs is entirely completed within a single six second combat round. Of course, the game is not designed to track velocity, so the final peasant in line will simply drop the rock harmlessly on the ground. But what's interesting is what happens while the rock is in transit. Let's assume your line of peasants is about a mile and a half long. Your rock or something will have broken the speed of sound. 42 mile line of peasants a line stretching a few days' foot travel between towns, perhaps, will have the rock briefly achieving escape velocity. Again, as a practical matter, this doesn't allow you to build a medieval space fortress, which is deeply unfortunate. However, enterprising players who realize that weaponizing this directly isn't the only use for this. If the object being passed was not a projectile, but was instead, say, a note, then you have instead created a peasant telegraph. Now, to be sure, the manpower needed for such a communication system are too steep to make it worthwhile for anything other than bragging rights. A network of semaphore towers or signal beacons would be much cheaper, and only somewhat slower for practical things like quickly sending messages long distances. But if you boil down the concept to one of handing off simple information, then it's not hard to imagine a creative necromancer going into business as a fantasy world's premier provider of computers. Yes, really. So instead of thousands of peasants, for example, you now have your necromancer animate thousands of skeletons. These are then lined up, and each skeleton is instructed to raise or lower its left arm in response to some outside yes or no question. Each skeleton has, at that point, become a transistor, an electrical switch that, in large numbers, form the basis of all modern electronics due to its ability to turn on and off. Transistors holding information in this yes or no, or more accurately on and off way, form the basis of machine language, which, guess what, is called binary due to its two-position arrangement. Holding enough information to mirror that in a modern flash drive would probably require billions of skeletons, but that's 21st century information technology for you. Something less ambitious, though. The mainframe computers used in the Apollo program, possibly, or the ENIAC, e -N -I -A -C, computers used in the Manhattan Project could be built with only a few hundred skeletons. Finally, for two rules that work in unexpected conjunction with each other, though my favorite was a situation back in AD&D, humans and other races with no natural low-light vision have trouble fighting in dark conditions. In total darkness, most characters were at a minus four penalty to hit, and that assumes they even guessed where the enemy was standing in the first place. 
under those conditions, even an attack roll of a natural 20, ordinarily a devastating critical strike, would not guarantee that you even hit the target if you attacked an empty spot. However, the penalty for fighting while on fire was only minus two. Oh, by the way, one quick note about the peasant railgun. The original Reddit thread that proposed it used simple actions instead of held actions, while the object being a spear or a pole instead of a rock, and the last guy's simple action was to throw said pole as soon as the next to last guy handed it to him. But my review of the rules suggests that would not have worked the way they thought it did. Perhaps we use different editions, though. In the latest edition of D&D, if two opponents are fighting in an open area, they typically just roll to hit each other. No advantage or disadvantage. But what if one of the fighters is a tricky drow and the other a human? The drow uses an innate ability to cast <gasps> darkness. The room goes pitch black. The human would seem to be in trouble, except nothing happens. The human is blinded, of course, meaning he has to roll disadvantage, which is to roll two dice, take the lowest, to hit, and is at an advantage to be hit, roll two dice, take the highest. However, this is magical darkness. The drow is also blinded. Both have advantage and disadvantage on attacks, which kind of cancels each other out. So technically, the drow's innate ability to cast darkness doesn't help him in the fight, despite his dark vision. But even stranger, both combatants, despite being blind, are hitting and being hit at exactly the rate they were before. This is kind of odd to me, and yes, I know this simplifies that you don't automatically know which square the opponent is in, and I know the drow would be better served casting darkness on the light source in the room instead of just blanketing the room with it, but that doesn't rule out what a strange mechanic it is. Ah. Probably the abuse potential of the Goodberry spell in 5th edition. Due to the lack of negative hit points, your druid gets to run around with 20 instant revives every day for the low, low cost of a single first level spell slot in the morning. Circle of the Land Druid, you say? Oh, then they get to take a short rest in the tavern before going out adventuring and get that spell slot right back anyway, baby. Without going into creative interpretation like the peasant railgun, as we've already covered, in 5th edition, no matter how large or close the target is, if it goes prone, a range attack will get disadvantage. So the Terrask, prone 10 feet away, becomes much harder to hit. That's really, really stupid. <laughs> this is Crossbow Master. Thanks to extensive practice with the crossbow, you gain the following benefits. You ignore the loading quality of crossbows with which you are proficient. Being within five feet of a hostile creature doesn't impose disadvantage on your ranged attack rolls. When you use the attack action and attack with a one-handed weapon, you can then use a bonus action to attack with a hand crossbow that you're holding. The second provision has no restriction, limiting it to crossbows. Therefore, you could also apply it to ranged spell attacks. This was confirmed by the designers on Sage Advice, and was, in fact, deliberate. They said that they wanted some feats to have this kind of cross-roll support to mimic how a real person would apply relevant knowledge from one field to another. I really like that idea. Hey everybody, Brian Von VA back at it again, checking in after the vid. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, ring that bell, and let us know down in the comments below what's the strangest D&D rules interaction you've encountered. We love you all. Please be safe, happy, and healthy. See you next time. Bye for now.